My first guest has been in the advertising business for many years. Mr. Lanre Adisa, you're welcome to Strictly Speaking. Thanks for having me. There was a time when advertising agencies would headhunt personnel for client service purposes. They would go out of their way to look for broadcasters because they were in a better position to represent the agency. Now, I'm not sure if that is what obtains today. I'm not sure if we're looking for people who speak well, then you teach them about client service, or you have somebody who is knowledgeable about, about client service who you then train to speak well. You're very right in terms of how advertising started. Um, the first crop of people who came into the business came from broadcasting. And I think there was a reason for that. Uh, we didn't have as many graduates of mass communication or English and all that as we do now. Uh, so the few people who they could really use uh, they were closest to advertising as we knew it then. Mm -hmm. uh, because remember then, most agencies were run by expatriates. Um, so it was easier for them to find the right fit yes. in broadcasters or people who had something to do with broadcasting. Mm -hmm. um, but things started changing after that. Um, we started producing more graduates of mass communication, mm -hmm. people who read English and uh, who were into creative writing. Mm -hmm. So by the time I came into the industry in 1990, uh, the bulk of the people then were coming from universities having either studied um, uh, f uh, fine art painting, if you were you know, uh, an art director, okay. uh, who were called visualizers in those days. Mm. Uh, or maybe you read English you know, and, um, and you were into writing. So that was important then because, again, we don't have advertising schools. You know, and we never did then. So the mm. you, you only way you could prove that you had a portfolio or anything worth you know, uh, 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 buying into was that, hey, you've been writing. And that was, the, that was the way into copywriting. Yes, and they will give you a copy test. But I'll tell you, uh, the standards are not the same as we had back then. You know, where these were people who were self-trained writers. Mm. Uh, some of them had done other things before coming into advertising. Okay. Uh, Julia so they had, they brought yeah, rich experiences. Yeah, Julia Oku, for instance, back then, you know, uh, yes, yes, uh, she, she was a lecturer at some mm. point before mm. coming into advertising. She was yes. an academic. Um, there were all sorts of people who, yeah. who were self-taught, who had, you know, good grounding in, in creative writing. Mm. Um, that we don't have a whole lot of, but we do have young people who are really talented as well. But, uh, but then, I'm sorry to interrupt, but... Um, what would you say about the intrusion of pop culture into today's writing? Well, there's nothing wrong with pop culture coming into the industry because you are relating with the real world also. Absolutely. And the audience you're dealing with, that's what they are used to. Mm. So for you to actually grab their attention, because advertising is all about the attention economy. That's all we're looking for. Yeah. So pop culture is very important. But... It is not just taking pop culture and not processing it professionally mm. in a way that people will appreciate it. Yes. I, I think that might just be the where the problem is. You can't just take pop, pop culture and regurgitate to people. I feel good. Some of the things that we produce, and I go to parties and people are singing the song. The DJ is playing the song. That's part of pop culture. Yes. So it's not enough to take from pop culture. Are you contributing to pop culture? Quite. Can we talk about voiceovers? You listen to jingles on radio and, uh, you know, TVCs. And I've observed sometimes that within the space of 60 seconds, you can actually hear the, um, the name of the product pronounced differently, maybe twice or three times. What, what do you have to say about the quality of voiceovers that we have now? Okay, I think the, the bigger problem actually is about standards. The, the right process is that there is somebody from the agency, mm -hmm. apart from the agency producer, there is the copywriter who wrote it, who must be in the studio with you to correct whatever. In fact, sometimes the client representative will also be with you in the studio. Right. So if you're getting it wrong, they will definitely correct you. Uh, but, but where we are now, there's a bit of a breakdown in that regard. So everybody is an all commas game to a large degree. As a matter of fact, in some, you know, uh, bygone days, shall I say, clients used to be very specific about who they wanted 
to voice their, their commercials. Yes. And if you introduced new people, you would have to make sure that you were in the studio so that uh, interpretation was right, uh, pronunciation was, was correct. Yep. But, well... Well, well I, some clients still do. Some clients still insist on certain voices. Okay. Uh, but not too many of that going on right now. Because, again, you know, part of why you have an agency is that you can hold somebody responsible. And until they get it right, you know... There's no deal. But if clients decide to do it on their own, then they live with whatever they live they're with given. It. Yeah, so, so they save money, no doubt, but they also do some damage. Mm. So looking at the bigger picture, something's got to give. Yes, uh, we all pay a price, end of the day. Um, but I think we should also backtrack a little bit. You know, how did we get here? Mm. Um, generally, as a society, we. We, we, we consider to have measures, you know, uh, as a people, and we still do. Um, I recall this particular cartoon I saw once in The Guardian, Nigerian Guardian. Uh, a guy goes to the bar and says, oh, I want a bottle of beer. So they give me a bottle of beer, but he now discovers that this is, you know, a half bottle of beer. Okay. So why are you giving me a half bottle of beer? <laughs> oh, I got money jam. <laughs> so, you know, um, he manages it. And it's time for him to pay. So mm. he brings out a Naira note that is also cut in half. And the guy's like, why are you paying me? <laughs> half currency, you know, oh, money jam. So I always use that as um, some kind of anecdote of where we are as a people. As uh, we are a money jam We people. manage jam, mm. you know, we manage the roads, we manage power, we manage everything. Uh, so the, the ripple effect of that is felt in every sphere of our lives. Mm. You know, so this is where we are. We cannot compete with the world if we are doing manage them, Absolutely. wherever we practice. You can't be in football and say you want to go to the World Cup and manage them. You know, you're going to the Olympics, you start practicing from the moment the last one is finishing. Yes. Um, so we cannot manage. I think when we start demanding more of ourselves, mm. uh, we will be in a better place. And the same goes for the language. Oh, you know, yes. We just, oh, yes. we can't afford any longer yes. to just manage them. Yep. Yeah. And I think that is a perfect note. To, to end our conversation, which I've enjoyed tremendously. Mr. Larry Adisa, thank you so much thank for you. coming on to Strictly Speaking. It's a great pleasure being here. Thank, thank you. you. After the break, another conversation, this time with John Sanaya, and we'll be looking at another aspect of public speaking. Do join me again. <laughs>